Welcome to our uh, 9.30 a.m. session with Dr. Keanu Sai, and the title of his talk is National Consciousness is the Foundation of a Cultural Consciousness. My name is Sydney Ialkea, and I will be the facilitator for this session. Mark Ellis is our moderator, and he'll be checking out the chat to see, um, to share with Keanu at the end of the talk any questions you might have. Mahalo Nui for joining us today. Thank you for being here. This session is, like they mentioned earlier, recorded for uh, future viewing. And we will mute everyone's mics during the presentation. You can use the meeting chat to ask questions or leave comments. And it's the um, bubble, the thought bubble, either at the top or the bottom of your screen. Please don't share your screen with the recording if you have off just click back onto the Microsoft Teams meeting link again to rejoin. <clears throat> Mark, would you like to add anything before I introduce Keanu? No, we're good. So mahalo everyone for joining us and please don't be offended if we mute you, um, but we want to focus on our presenter. Mahalo. Thank you, Mark. Okay, uh, Dr. Sai is a lecturer at the University of Hawaii Windward Community College Departments of Political Science and Hawaiian Studies. And he's an affiliate faculty member at UH Manoa College of Education. Dr. Sai received his PhD and MA degrees in political science, specializing in international relations and public law, with a focus on the continued existence of the nope. Hawaiian Kingdom. Yeah, he's gone. He's gone. And just as a side note, he's influenced so many of us in our own work, and it really is a privilege to introduce my good friend Keanu. So mm -hmm. I'll hand it over to you. Hello, my couple. Hello, is everybody? Uh, my name is Keanu. Um, I am a graduate of the Kamehameha Schools, graduated back in 1982. <clears throat> uh, after Kamehameha Schools, went on to a military college, New Mexico Military Institute. Got my associate's degree in pre-business, a commission as a second lieutenant in the Army Reserve, then transferred to UH to get my bachelor's, and then graduated in 1987, and then pursued 10 years of a military career. Uh, got out in 1994 as a captain, field artillery officer. And a lot of what I experienced in the military has really infused in me a way of thinking that is a little different from other people. But it's also tempered with being raised as a Hawaiian in Kuli O'o, the Rees Ohana. And uh, it, it, it allowed me in the military Reed, Ohana. to see things <clears throat> for what it is. And in a way, got to deal with it. So it's like back then we're trained to take on the Soviet Union. We weren't intimidated by the Soviet Union. We just figured out how to take them on should war ever break out. So a lot of the professional training that I received was really in management, uh, professional development and so forth. Well, now I find myself in the realm of political science, but because my doctoral research focused on Hawaii and its status as a country, it, 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 it naturally brings in issues of culture. But the culture that I wanna talk about here today is the national culture, right? And what is that national culture with regard to a particular ethnic group's culture, right? And national culture is also called national consciousness. So, so with that being said, I would like to begin my PowerPoint presentation and then it should last for about half an hour and then we'll open up for question and answers and we have some dialogue, okay? So here we go. Okay, so, okay, so the title of my presentation is National Consciousness is the Foundation of a Cultural Consciousness. National Consciousness, which is also known as national culture, is the behaviors, beliefs, customs, and political values shared by the population of a sovereign nation. So according to Engelhardt and Baker, again, the nation remains a key unit of shared experience and its educational and cultural institutions shape the values 
of almost everyone in that society. Culture, on the other hand, pertains to or is a characteristic of people, especially an ethnic group sharing a common and distinctive culture, religion, and language. When speaking to an ethnic group of people, its culture that lies within the national culture of a country is called a subculture. So the American national culture, right? Well, the founding fathers of the United States were foolish. And the political values of the United States was formed by their experience as British subjects under a monarchical form of government in the Americas, which led to a non-monarchical form of government called a republic through revolution. The political values of the United States national culture centers on a Republican form of government. Subcultures within the United States national culture include, but are not limited to, German Americans. Now, German Americans may exercise and express a cultural issue it's very similar to Germans in Germany, right? But it's different if they're in the United States because this is a subculture within the United States national culture, in this case, German Americans. Also, Italian Americans or Japanese Americans. All three subcultures. <laughs> I was afraid to look. Of the United States, of a Republican form of government, while their ethnic cultures are distinct and different. Glad that exclamation will. Was there a Hawaiian national culture prior to the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian government in 1893? Were there subcultures within a Hawaiian national culture? And what were the political values in the Hawaiian national culture that were the same in the subcultures? Well, the founding father of the Hawaiian kingdom was Kamehameha I, and the language of the country was Hawaiian. The political values of the Hawaiian kingdom was formed by experience as Hawaiian subjects, which was based on a monarchical form of government that evolved into a constitutional monarchy. This monarchical form of government was very Polynesian based, based upon the ali'i ana, the chief police system. The political values of the Hawaiian national culture then centered on a monarchical form of government, not a republican form of government. Now the nationality of the Hawaiian kingdom, citizenry, they're called Hawaiian subjects. The native population of Hawaiian subjects are called Aboriginal Hawaiian, both pure and part. And this is indicated in Article 13 of Bernie's Powahi's will, where it states, I direct my trustees to devote a portion of each year's income to the support and education of orphans and others in indigent circumstances, giving preference to Hawaiians of pure part Aboriginal blood. This means that a person can be Hawaiian, which is a Hawaiian subject, but not Aboriginal. Mm. Now, Hawaiian subcultures that existed prior to 1893 included Aboriginal Hawaiians and non-Aboriginal Hawaiians and resident aliens. These subcultures all shared, however, the same political value of the Hawaiian kingdom of a monarchical form of government. So here's a brief history of the Hawaiian kingdom that kind of puts this into context. In 1794, Hawaii became a British protectorate by agreement between Captain Vancouver and King Kamehameha I, and the British ensign was the flag of Hawaii. If you notice here, what is missing is the St. Patrick's cross, which is like an X, right? That won't come into play until 1801. So at this time, what you have this is the cross of St. George, the Red Cross, and then the white X, which is the cross of St. Andrews. In 1816, Kamehameha I ordered the formation of the Hawaiian flag that became the flag of the Hawaiian kingdom. And in this flag, you see in the Union Jack, the, the, the cross of St. Patrick's is included. Now, in 1843, the British and the French jointly recognized the Hawaiian kingdom as an independent state. This is when the Hawaiian kingdom broke away from Great Britain and became its own independent state under international law. But it maintained a monarchical form of government. 
this is different. Where in America, you had the British subjects who were part of the British colonies revolting in their revolt. They changed their monarchical form of government into a republic. So what we have here is it's important to know that national cultures are based upon experience, right? Experience of the people of that country. So Hawaii, while it became independent, still maintained a monarchical form of government. And recognition was then followed in 1844 by Secretary of State John C. Calhoun on behalf of President Tyler, where he recognized the independence of the Hawaiian government, again, recognizing that Hawaii is its own country. By 1893, Hawaii maintained over 90 embassies and consulates throughout the world. And here we have a collection of letterheads from the different consulates and embassies, consulates and embassies throughout the world. Top left here, you got Hawaiian legation or embassy, Washington, D.C. The Hawaiian kingdom was one of only three non-European powers in the family of nations throughout the 19th century. The Hawaiian kingdom was a recognized neutral state by treaty, along with Belgium, Luxembourg, and Switzerland. Aboriginal Hawaiians throughout the islands received universal health care at no charge. This was uncommon at that time. Universal health care did not arise until after World War II in what we call the Nordic countries, Norway, Sweden. Here, Hawaii had universal health care for its people since 1859, the establishment of Queen's Hospital. And, and the Hawaiian kingdom was a constitutional monarchy and literacy was second to Scotland. And when I say literacy, literacy in the Hawaiian language. Between 1880 and 1892, 18 Hawaiian subjects participated in the Hawaiian Youths Abroad Program, where they studied in England, Scotland, Italy, United States, China, and Japan. Here's a picture of Joseph Kamauoha in England. In England, they attended King's College and St. Chad's College. Subjects included military training, ironworks, medicine, engraving, and sculpture. The founder of modern China, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, attended Iolani and Oahu College in Honolulu from 1879 to 1883. When he came back to Hawaii in 1910, he was interviewed by a reporter. And he told the reporter, this is my Hawaii. Here I was brought up and educated, and it was here that I came to know what modern civilized governments are like and what they mean. Now, on December 8, 1891, two years before the American invasion, there was a mass meeting of over 600 Hawaiian subjects, both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal. This will speak to that political value yeah, of the Hawaiian culture, uh, national culture. The subject of the meeting was the denunciation against adopting a Republican form of government for Hawaii. Speakers included James Kaulia, Anton Rosa, Iaia, Kauluko, Achi, Kahoone, Poi Poi, Kanui, Poi, or Poi, Lilikani, Lilikalani, and Malo. The following resolutions were passed. Quote, whereas a report has been propagated throughout the United States concerning the belief that the Hawaiian people are standing ready to revolutionize Hawaii's present form of government, that is a monarchical government, to a Republican form of government, either by annexation to the American Republic or to be an independent republic. And such reports have been published in numerous American papers that have reached Hawaii name. And whereas... Similar open reports have been published by certain newspapers of this city. And as these reports will certainly strengthen the belief that these reports spread throughout the United States are valid, as shown above. And if these reports are not contradicted by the Hawaiian nation, by publicly making known their disapproval and contradicting the truth of such reports, then their silence in this matter is a proof of the truth of such reports now being circulated. And that will also confirm the belief that the Hawaiian nation is against their beloved queen and to remove her from the throne of Hawaii. And whereas this is a question that deeply concerns the monarchical form of government of Hawaii name, and it is proper that such threatening rumors may be repelled strongly and firmly by the Hawaiian people. Therefore, this mass meeting held on the evening of December 28, 1891 in the city of Honolulu, island of Oahu, do pass the following resolutions. 
Be it resolved that the native sons of the soil do continually disapprove the idea to discontinue and change Hawaii's mon monarchical form of government. But by this, they certify to uphold forever that form of government, and likewise to uphold the queen and the throne of Hawaii. And they are always bitter against the said movement. Be it resolved that the native sons of the soil do repeatedly disapprove any scheme to establish a Republican form of government in place of Hawaii's present monarchical government, the government for which the ancestors of the rising generation of Hawaii may had bled by fighting for this blessing. Be it resolved that the Hawaiian nation do forever protest against any scheme annexing this government to any foreign government in order to satisfy the cry converting Hawaii into a republic. And finally, be it resolved that it be publicly declared that the reports widely circulated that the Hawaiian people are standing ready to adopt and embrace a Republican form of government for them, either independently or by annexation, are false and without foundation. James Kaulia, who later became the president of the Hawaiian Patriotic League, Hui Aloha'aina, stated, read the history of republics and you will find out that the Aborigines bring to, in this case, Native Americans, have always been driven to the mountains and holes like rats and cats. William Achi stated, if we look back to the days of the Kamehamehas and the succeeding sovereigns of Hawaii name, our government has always been a monarchy. But as soon as we have a queen to rule over us, Republican, a Republican movement soon arises. And Kauluku, Kauluku said, England cherishes her queen, and we should adore our queen. Our ancestors have been accustomed to a monarchical form of government, and we, the younger generations, have been instilled with undying loyalty to our sovereign. Our forefathers considered love of the throne, love of country, and love of the people as one. Now, this is a window into what is called Hawaiian national culture from our people, both Aboriginal Hawaiian and non-Aboriginal. So now we get into the United States invasion of the Hawaiian kingdom just two years later and the overthrow of the monarchical government. Judge Greenwood, from the International Court of Justice states that traditional international law was based upon a rigid distinction between the state of peace and the state of war. Countries were either in a state of peace or in a state of war. There was no intermediate state, and acts of war is what triggers a state of war under international law where different rules apply between the countries. And a state of war includes belligerent occupation. By direction of Hawaii's Queen Lili Okalani, President Cleveland in March of 1893 initiated the investigation of the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom government on January 17, 1893. On December 18th, 11 months later, the president reported to the Congress his findings and conclusions of that investigation. He told the Congress that on the 16th day of January, 1893, between four and five o'clock in the afternoon, a detachment of Marines from the United States steamer Boston with two pieces of artillery landed at Honolulu. The men upwards of 160 in all were supplied with double cartridge belts and were accompanied by a hospital corps with stretchers and medical supplies. He stated that this military demonstration upon the soil of Honolulu was of itself an act of war. This is significant because this is the head of state stating what the actions taken by the U.S. military in a foreign country was considered an act of war. This is what triggered a state of war in international relations. President then concluded that by an act of war with the participation of a diplomatic representative of the United States and without the authority of Congress, the government of a feeble but friendly and confiding people has been overthrown. The provisional government owes its existence to an armed invasion by the United States. Now, the change here from a monarchical form of government okay, did not take place through any act of our own people, but rather by the act of the United States military and that the provisional government owes its existence to an armed invasion. These acts of war committed by the United States triggered a state of war with the Hawaiian Kingdom. Now it's important to know 
that there's a difference between what is called the country or the state and its government. Because in international relations, countries do go to war, whether justly or unjustly. But when a, when a country overthrows the government of another country during a state of war, that does not equate to the overthrow of the country. The country still exists. It's just that its government government had been overthrown, meaning its government that exercises that sovereignty in administering the law is no longer there. This is then replaced by the occupation supposed to do that until they get a treaty. Now, customary international law in 1893 obligated the United States as the occupying state to administer the laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom and not the laws of the United States when they are in effective control of Hawaiian territory. This obligation is now codified under Article 43 of the 1907 Hague Regulations and Article 64 of the 1949 Geneva Convention. The U.S. did not administer Hawaiian Kingdom law and unilaterally annexed or seized the Hawaiian Islands in 1898. Now, under international law, the military overthrow of a country's government does not equal an overthrow of the country, which is called the state. According to Professor Brownlee, renowned expert in international law, he says, after the defeat of Nazi Germany in the Second World War, the four major allied powers assumed supreme power in Germany. The legal competence of the German state, meaning its independence and sovereignty, did not, however, disappear. What occurred is akin to legal representation or agency of necessity. The German state continued to exist, and indeed, the legal basis of the occupation depended on its existence. So in other words, the Hawaiian kingdom as a state continued to exist despite our government being illegally overthrown in 1893. So how does a state acquire the territory of another state under international law? Well, according to Professor Oppenheim, he says session of state territory is the transfer of sovereignty over state territory by the owner state to another state. And the only form in which a session can be affected is an agreement embodied in a treaty between the ceding and the acquiring state. So here we have two sovereign states represented by their governments. One will cede territory to another state under a treaty. This could be voluntary during a state of peace or involuntary during a state of war. Either case, you have a treaty. Well, here we have the first treaty between the United States and France in 1803. And that is how the United States acquired this territory west of the Mississippi River. After 1803, that was French territory. After 1803, American territory. And then we have what we know today as Florida. That was transferred by by treaty of session by the Spanish in 1819. And then we have the British, Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, transferred in 1846. This is what is called ceded territory, ceded lands, all during a state of peace. But the United States had acquired all territory north of the Rio Grande in the area we call today as California, New Mexico, Texas, and Arizona. And that was in 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that transferred all Mexican territory north of the Rio Grande as a result of the Mexican-American War or State of War. So what is the authority of Hawaii session? How did the United States acquire Hawaii? Well, July 7, 1898, Joint Resolution Number 55 to provide for annexing the Hawaiian Islands to the United States. The problem is, this is not a treaty. This is a law passed by the U.S. Congress, yeah, a law passed by the U.S. Congress. It is important to note that laws of the United States have no effect beyond its borders. In fact, this is exactly what Saddam Hussein tried to do in 1990 when he said that Kuwait was annexed after he invaded Kuwait and overthrew its government. And everybody knew back then Kuwait cannot pass a law or excuse me. Iraq could not pass a law declaring that another country has been annexed because that law is limited to its own territory. The same would apply to Hawaii in 1898. 
And the congressional records signify this. President Senator William Allen from Nebraska stated clearly on the congressional record regarding the so-called attempt to annex Hawaii by a municipal law. He stated that the Constitution and the statutes are territorial in their operation. And they cannot have any binding force or operation beyond the territorial limits of the government in which they are promulgated. In other words, the Constitution and statutes cannot reach across the territorial boundaries of the United States into the territorial domain of another government and affect that government or persons or property therein. He later stated on the congressional record that the joint resolution is ipso facto null and void because it's not an argument. American law has no effect beyond the borders of the United States. The United States could no more annex Hawaii by passing a law than the United States Congress today can pass a law annexing Canada, annexing Mexico. It is void. Well, nevertheless, two years later, the United States Congress passes another law changing the name of the Hawaiian Kingdom government that belonged to the people of Hawaii, changing the name of that government to the territory of Hawaii. What a lot of people don't realize is that what changed physically in 1893 was only the forced removal of the queen and her cabinet and the head of the police force, Marshal Charles Wilson. Everyone in government was told to stay in place and to sign oaths of allegiance to the new regime who were being protected by the U.S. Marines. And that was the basis for that song that was played earlier here, Kaulana Napua or Mele Aloha Aina, the Patriot song, where one of the verses says, do not sign the paper of the enemy with its sin of annexation and loss of Hawaiian civil rights. So keeping in mind, though, all that changed in 1893 was the queen and her cabinet. Changed the name to the provisional government. Then it was changed to the Republic of Hawaii. And then in 1900, it was changed again to the territory of Hawaii. It's the same governmental infrastructure. It's called a hijacking. That's all it is. It's not a new government. And then in 1959, the United States Congress passes another law, transforming the name of the territory of Hawaii into the state of Hawaii. Now, throughout this process, our kupuna, who were born after 1893, are, be are being taught a different version of history than what you are looking at here. Very different. And then in 1993, the United States passes a joint resolution on the 100th anniversary of the illegal overthrow and apologizes for it. But imbued in this joint resolution is a lot of disinformation, not misinformation, disinformation that says Native Hawaiians are the indigenous people of the United States that has a similar status with Native Americans. Nothing can be farther from the truth. A country as an independent state, if only its government was overthrown and its treaty has not been, a, and no treaty has acquired its territory, it is still a country. Aboriginal Hawaiians are not indigenous people within the United States. This was part of the narrative that has been developing in creating this facade that somehow the Hawaiian kingdom was did not belong to our people, but it somehow was created by the missionaries, you know, the evil boogeyman, right? The white people, nothing can be farther from the truth. And the evidence clearly shows that from our kupuna's ass. Nevertheless, the laws themselves, the Joint Resolution of Annexation, the Territorial Act, the Statehood Act, the resolution apologizing for the overthrow, what they all have in common, they are all American law, municipal laws passed by Congress. What does the U.S. Supreme Court say? Well, in 1936, it said, neither the Constitution nor the laws passed in pursuant of it have any force in foreign territory. Which reiterates what Senator William Allen was saying. And it said the operations of the nation in such territory must be governed by treaties, international understandings and compacts, and the principles of international law. And this is what I covered, and this is why Hawaii is occupied. Not because I made a position statement. No, it's the facts reveal that by an act of war, the government of a friendly and confiding people has been overthrown, but that doesn't equate to the overthrow of the country. We call that in international law, belligerent occupation.
So why is it that we don't know this, right? Something that seems so obvious today when we look at the facts. Well, denationalization, that's why. Here we're going to take a quote from Samuel Damon, the lead insurgent. He's an enemy of the kingdom. He was also at the same time in 1895 when he made this statement, he was a trustee of the Kamehameha. In fact, all of the trustees, including Charles R. Bishop, were insurgents. Samuel Damon stated on the record, on the minutes of the cabinet council, he said, if we are ever to have peace and annexation, the first thing to do is to obliterate the past. Denationalization is to obliterate the national consciousness of the occupied state. In 1919, denationalization was listed as a war crime, as attempts to denationalize the inhabitants of occupied territory. Stemming from Italy's occupation in the Second World War, Yugoslav charge 1434 stated, Apart from deporting and interning innocent persons, the Italians started a policy on a vast scale of denationalization. As part of such policy, they started a system of re-education of Yugoslav children. This re-education consisted of forbidding children to use their Serbo-Croat language, to sing Yugoslav songs, and forcing them to salute in a fascist way. Here in Hawaii, 1906, a formal policy of brainwashing through, through Americanization was initiated in the, in the schools throughout Hawaii. Okay. So now they are going to now turn this into a policy of what Samuel Damon had expressed as an opinion. The theme of the program was to indoctrinate the children of Hawaii to be American and to speak English. Harper's Weekly Magazine sent a reporter to Hawaii in 1906 to follow and do a story on this process. And he visited, this reporter visited three schools, Kaiolani Public School, Kahumanu Public School, and Honolulu High School before the name was changed to President William McKinley High School. Well, I, while he, the reporter was visiting Kaiolani Public School, which was, had over 600 school children, he, he, he followed the principal, and upon his command, he saw the children marching in unison, heading up to the American flag, and at the command of the principal, they would salute. And that's, you notice, this is a civilian salute. Almost looks like a Nazi salute, but that's what's called a civilian salute. It's called the Bethel salute the United States. And at the command, which, by the way, is my tutu's generation. Yelling unison, we give our heads and our hearts to God and our country. One country, one language, one flag. The caption says this scene shows a salute to the American flag which flies in the grounds of the Kaiolani Public School, which has many Japanese. The drill is constantly held as a means of inculcating patriotism in the hearts of the children. That word inculcate is brainwashing through repetition. And if you speak your national language, we now know our kupuna were beaten. They were severely disciplined, right? Now this brainwashing basically became institutionalized when it got to my parents' generation, when my dad was born in 1939. And by the time it reached my generation, when I was at the Kamehameha schools, out of sight, out of mind, I had nothing to, to recollect or know of what even is a Hawaiian national culture. British novelist Dresden James once wrote, which is so appropriate, when a well-packaged web of lies has been sold gradually to the masses over generations, the truth will seem utterly preposterous and its speaker a raving lunatic. So with this information, what do you do about it? How do you, how do you address this monolith, right? Well, we're gonna address denationalization through academic research. 
And it's going to stem from the Larson case that was held at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in the Netherlands that verified the Hawaiian Kingdom still exists and is occupied by the United States. We knew that we needed to address this very important uh, uh, issue because while I was at The Hague in the Netherlands, we were called to a meeting by an ambassador from Rwanda who had been reviewing all the records of the proceedings because it was open to the public. Other countries could step into the court and actually retrieve the transcripts and the pleadings. And in a meeting that I had with him, with my legal team in Brussels, Belgium, he admitted that his government has all the records and it is clear what is occupied and it cannot be tolerated. And that he asked for permission to now take this issue before the United Nations General Assembly to bring it to the attention of the international community of Hawaii's prolonged occupation and to begin, begin compliance with the law of occupation. After a short meeting, uh, after a short meeting with my legal team, I sat back down in front of the ambassador and I said, please convey to your president our sincere gratitude, but we cannot accept this software at this time. This is December of 2000, 21 years ago. I said, we need to address denationalization. Our people back home have no clue of this profound of the profound status that we have as a country. And we need to address denationalization head on. He thanked me. I thanked him. Meeting came to a close. And that is when we arrived home. The decision was made. I will now re-enter the University of Hawaii. And I'm going to pursue a master's degree and a PhD degree, PhD degree in political science. And I'm going to address that misinformation head on. It's not an ethnic issue, head on. And that's what prompted academic publications that have uh, developed. And this is merely the tip of the iceberg. Our people now, young Hawaiians and other and non-Aboriginal Hawaiians and foreigners are beginning to ask the right questions. They're not talking about when will the United States recognize the Hawaiian kingdom's independence? No, the Hawaiian kingdom never lost its independence. The proper question is, when is the United States going to begin to comply with the law of occupation and end the occupation? See, these are different questions that bring out different research. Okay. But these are this is information that is currently being taught throughout the schools, uh, throughout Hawaii, throughout universities around the world, right? And more importantly, it is also it was also addressed by the uh, Hawaii State Teachers Association. So at its annual convention back in 2017, Hawaii State Teachers Association, its delegates introduced the resolution, new business item 37, that the NEA will publish an article that documents the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy in 1893, the prolonged illegal occupation of the United States in the Hawaiian kingdom and the harmful effects that this occupation has had on the Hawaiian people and resources of the land. When the delegates got home, I spoke with one of them. Her name is Amy Peruso. That's her on the far right. And she was the secretary for the Hawaii State Teachers Association, as well as treasurer. Well, I was asked if I could write those articles for the delegates to submit to the National Education uh, Association. And the first article was published April 2nd, 2018, the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom government. Notice it did not say the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom. It clarifies that it was the government that was overthrown, not the country. The second article, the U.S. occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And the third article, the impact of the U.S. occupation on the Hawaiian people. And in here I cover denationalization and also Hawaii's universal health care. So, in closing, okay, in light of that information that I just shared, let's take another look at American national culture. Well, indicators of, a, of an American national consciousness here in Hawaii, okay, amongst First, a person identifies oneself with the Republican form of government. That's under the American National Code. Also, that person identifies oneself as an indigenous people within the United States. That is an American national culture. A person identifies oneself as a Hawaiian. 
Well, this is evidence of the war crime of denationalization through Americanization. That's a typo. It should be denationalization through Americanization. But now in light of education and our people learning the truth, Hawaiian national culture, indicators of Hawaiian national consciousness, identifying oneself with a monarchical form of government, identifying oneself as a national of an occupied state, and identifying oneself as a Hawaiian subject. This is evidence of being a Hawaiian subject. So what we have there is pretty much laying out the broader context of what we've taken for granted at the micro level, right? So when we see culture from a, a, a national culture perspective, it, it it resonates now when I when when I when I read of and look up just from Hilo. How did he express his culture? Well, he was an attorney, a very proud attorney. He was a statesman. He served at, in the legislature. He also was a painter, an artist. Right. He encouraged Hawaiians in the Puna area to form corporations. In fact, when Navahi was in California when he was sick. Did you know he was there not only to seek assistance in his, with his help, but he was looking at how the banking system operated. That's what he was interested in. You know, so it, it gives us an idea of how diverse in expressing their particular culture, but it all happened within the national culture or that national consciousness. For myself, as a, former, as a former army officer, I took for granted the American national consciousness. That's why I joined the army. And when that balloon goes up, we get ready to fire live rounds. But for me, it was a wake up call. I was in the wrong army. And then I thought about it again. Well, maybe I wasn't in the wrong army. I was in the Hawaii Army National Guard. We've been deployed to wars all the time. But the history of the Hawaii Army National Guard, in fact, it used to be called the King's Guard. So remember when I shared that only name changes took place? The provisional government in 1893, all they did was take over the King's Guard and rename it the National Guard. That was not created by the United States. So when I looked at it, I went, well, okay. I was a soldier. I am still a soldier. And I actually served in the Hawaiian Army. The only thing that I needed to change, though, was my national consciousness. And that... I needed to look to our kupuna of the past to inform me of who I am and my national identity. And I'm very fine with that. So now when I say I was in the Army, in the United States Army, I was a mercenary. Paid well, trade, uh, trained very well. And that's how we refocus. That's how we adjust yeah, in light of what we now see is a crisis. In the Army, we would call this crisis management, right? And how you deal with hard issues. And how you deal with hard issues, you get more information. And that's why I'm a fervent believer in education, responsible education. And with that, uh, let me turn it back over to Sydney. And uh, let's see if uh, we can have any dialogue here. Uh, mahalo, everyone, for listening. Awesome, awesome job, Keanu. Thank you. Uh, I'll I'll actually hand it over to Mark to see if there's any questions. If you have questions, we have about six minutes. We're stopping at 1020 or so. So just go ahead and drop them in the chat and we'll see what we get. All right, um, aloha. So some of the questions have been coming in. Um, there's one that talks about the 1871 Organic Act, and that that act compromised the integrity of the original American Constitution. 1871 Organic Act. Um, not familiar with that, but that would be the American national consciousness, which has its own history, it has its own legal proceedings, as distinct from the Hawaiian national consciousness that had its own constitutional evolution and its laws and policies and administration. You know? So I, I, I don't know about that. 
Okay. We have another kind of a, another great one. Um, will we be recognized at the Olympics? Okay, that's a good question. You know, see, now we're starting to ask the right questions. <laughs> so it's not that we need people to recognize us first, but we need to recognize ourselves and then express that. So when you go to the Olympics, you're going there because countries participate in the Olympics, right? So there is a process to become a, 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 a part of the Olympics. And that was actually already done and filed with the Olymp National Olympic Committee. And um, Alika Deshe was serving as the president of the Hawaiian Kingdom National Olympic Committee that put it together. And they were in communication through their legal representative, a professor of international law from Italy, in direct communication with the National Olympic Committee. So you're still going to be dealing with the politics of issues yeah, of power, but you still stick to the rule of law. And as the dust settles, things are already there. So it's important here to know that it, we have to know first who we are before we know where we can go. When we, were, when we entered the permanent court of arbitration, we did not ask permission, can we come and enter your court? No, according to certain rules, you can enter if you are an independent. So we operated that way and they accepted it. So what we have here is a different way of approach. We don't try to go out and get people to believe us. No, you gotta believe in yourself. And it cannot be a false belief. You cannot say, oh, Dr. Sai said, you gotta, you have to own it. Meaning it is our kupuna that are guiding us. It is not us guiding ourselves. It is our kupuna guiding us because it is our level that drives us into the future. The word for future is kavar mahope, or the time of the past. It is in that past that we capitalize on successes and we learn from mistakes. That is when we hold them only after you know your past. Another way of looking at it is the practical value of history is that it's a film of the past run through the projector of today onto the screen of tomorrow. That film never changes, but your projector has to get updated to process that film. Once you process that film, you now see a, you now have Ike, you now see something you didn't see before. And that is because of the film, not because what I said. And that's why education is really important and we have to continue to address denationalization in a very professional and responsible way and not drive ethnic divisions, you no, know, because there were people in the Hawaiian kingdom that were Hawaiians, short for Hawaiian subject, that weren't Aboriginal. And we have to keep that in mind, right? The majority of our people were, the Aboriginal population were the majority of the national population and still are today. But that's a given. But we need to see it, just like how Bernice Powahi had written it, in her uh, will, Hawaiians of Aboriginal blood, both pure and part, Kanaka Maoli and Hapa. That means you can be Hawaiian and not be Aboriginal. These are the things we need to start to relearn that our kupuna had already knew. All right, thanks. Um, we got some questions regarding the slide deck and if it will be available later. Um, and then there was one specific question asking about the Damon quote about obliterating the memory of the past. And so will the slide deck be available or? Yep, I went ahead and uh, I sent Sydney the PowerPoint so everyone can get a copy of it. Yeah, so I guess, I guess making that request to you folks and uh, it's all there. Yeah. Perfect, thanks. Um, another question, how should we deal with the political powers when others do not follow the rule of the law? Well, again, this goes back to us owning our information and that when we do talk to each other, we should remember we shouldn't be talking at each other. We should be talking to each other, right? So find some common ground, you know, and I found that education is a very good way to bridge that, right? So say, hey, I guess you didn't know this. You know what I learned in class? 
But did you know that I actually have an easier time explaining this to former military people or people currently in the military because it's just intel. It's just information. I found that the people that have the hardest time with this information are those who believed it and uh, and they're civilians and and they don't and they get very it gets very uncomfortable, right? Well, to be uncomfortable is a sign that it's true. It's just you're not accepting it yet. <laughs> you know, if it was frivolous, you wouldn't be uncomfortable because this guy's a lunatic. He's saying Hawaii's still a country. <laughs> It's real, but it's a process. And we are dealing with over a hundred years of brainwashing. The ship is not going to turn on a dime, but we all have to do our part and have our kuleana to slowly turn this ship. Because what you don't want is gravitational force affecting our ship. So if you turn the ship too quick, you know what happens, right? Everybody f goes overboard, <laughs> the gravity. It's got to be slow. And I can tell you, since we, got back, since we got back from the Netherlands, the language is now being used at the University of Hawaii through, because of the research. There's a radical shift, a radical shift. In fact, John Osorio, the dean of Hawaii Nui was stated in an interview that he did with a graduate student that we should not be comparing ourselves to the Cheyennes or the Choctaw. We are people of a country that has been occupied. We should be comparing ourselves to countries that have been invaded by Nazi Germany. And I was like, perfect. I mean, that's that's who we are, right? And and it, it takes time. It takes time. But people will now be held accountable. This is no longer us against them. If my if I hear my my uncle tell me that we were calling I have a responsibility to explain to my uncle, no, uncle, that's, that, that's actually not correct. Let me try to explain what colonization means in light of our history. Or if my auntie says we're indigenous people and that we have a right to self-determination to be our own nation, uh, auntie, let me explain to you what the word indigenous people means. And it's from the United Nations. It means people that exist within a country, not that they are a country. You know, so it is a way to educate and it's a way to discuss. So we have to continue to talk to each other and not at each other. That's what is so important. Okay. Uh, thank you, Keanu, on that note. I really just want to thank you for all that information. And I know people will probably still have questions. And if there's a way um, for them to get those answers, maybe you can drop the email in the if you want to, I'm not putting you on the spot or any other way. I know HawaiianKingdom.org is the website. Well, so that's, if, yeah. well I, people, you, you guys can contact me at my, my UH web uh, email, anu a -N -U at hawaii.edu, anu a -N -U at hawaii.edu. And I'll probably point to resources that we use at the university that informs and, and exposes this information and encourages dialogue. But, you know, I really want to say mahalo to uh, Commitment Mark, all you folks, and uh, all you folks here before attending. Uh, it's been a pleasure to share with you a bit of our history with you. And uh, I'll hopefully see you folks in the future and everybody be safe. And uh, take your ohana. Aloha. Mahalo, Nui. Aloha. Thank you, everyone, for coming.